now. Uh, let, let me uh, set the context. Uh, the promise and perils of the drone revolution, that's what we are going to discuss about. We are going to be talking about how do we capitalize on the drone potential. Drone, as we all know, is a transformative technology. It has huge applications. Uh, last count, we had more than 100 different use cases cutting across various sectors. So the promise of drones is well understood. How do we capitalize on that potential? We are going to be discussing that and what are the specific uh, actions that can be taken up. We will not be covering defense-related drones. Uh, this is more about commercial and societal applications, just to be clear. Uh, number two, how do we really make the actual international partnerships? I think as part of the global agenda for sci-fi, we would like to really discuss about how do we uh, leverage international partnerships, uh, not just for India, but even for the global markets. And how do we scale uh, all these opportunities? Beyond that, we also, maybe if time permitting, or maybe during the question answers, or even during dinner, we could discuss about some of the perils or some of the risks from drones. We don't want to get into that in the immediate beginning. And I think with, with the, the whole discussion, then focusing more on the promise and less on the risk, all of us end up for a long period of time talking more about the risk. I think today, let's maybe focus more on the promise and how do we realize that potential for drones. Uh, let me start uh, first uh, by maybe requesting uh, Amber to share some of... Uh, so as we all know, uh, India is now leading in terms of the drone regulations. Uh, from especially since August 2021, where the old uh, drone rule, UAV rules were repealed, uh, the new drone rules uh, 2021 came into effect. And from that time, we've seen uh, exponential growth in the Indian drone market. Uh, all the 250 plus startups, they're doing exceedingly well. And a large number of orders from the government and the, uh, let's say, public sector as well as the private sector have now been placed. So from a drone regulatory perspective, there's a lot of things that the government, and I would once again believe the Ministry of Civil Aviation did a stellar job uh, working with the Prime Minister's office in making all that happen. What I would really like to ask is about what made that happen? Uh, was it some of the larger impact of the schemes that were running? Was it something else uh, that the potential was realized? So, Amber, if you could just maybe share a short brief on that. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rajan, and very good evening to all of you. Uh, I'll keep it very short so that we can keep it uh, more interactive. Uh, see, this is uh, uh, a technology which is almost like the internet of the 80s or maybe the mobiles of the, last, uh, of the late 90s or the early 2000s. It was a technology uh, which had a neg uh, negative narrative, sort of. Uh, 2018, 19, 20, we see a lot of that Saudi Aramco, that Iran strike. So uh, people only saw the negative side of drones and all the action that was happening in Iraq and Afghanistan right next to next door. So the uh, prevailing thinking within the government policy makers was that, I mean, this is something which have to, we have to protect our people from. Okay, so it had so many restrictions that, uh, frankly, even in green zones, green zones were just about 8 or 10% of the Indian land, land mass. And within that also, you were allowed up to 400 feet. And uh, the only green zones were just uh, about 80 or 100 kilometers away from the big cities. And there too, you had to come to our government site and uh, log in and take uh, that password. And with that password was the software lock, which will open your drone and then you'll fly. But pretty much, it meant that you can't fly a drone. And then uh, after two years, I mean, I'll, I'll just fast forward two years because time is short, dinner is waiting. Uh, so in two years, after two years of lots of discussions across ministries and uh, Rajan mentioned Prime Minister's office also got involved. And we realize our mistake. It's not a mistake. It's like, you know, we are, we are a thinking uh, uh, a country with a thinking government. So a lot of feedback which came from people like Rajan, from Fiki, and from other industry associations, young startups, and uh, our Prime Minister himself is very, very open and he, it talks to these youngsters, there's a digital India, there's a young India, there's a startup India. So he gets that feedback uh, head on and face to face, cutting through uh, layers of bureaucracy. So somewhere in the whole conversation, we realized that we made a mistake. And this technology, instead of uh, just uh, putting more layers and layers of security, we need to start looking at the positive side of it. Understand that, yes, so there will be those uh, 2, 5, or 10% of the rogue elements who will misuse that technology. But 90% uh, people will actually make good use of it. And also, there's a very friendly neighbor up north and uh, to our west, uh, all armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons. And uh, uh, we are already 20 years behind our northern neighbor. And every day, they are not sleeping. And they're only moving far ahead. So 
it's up to us to keep on delaying things and uh, so we woke up and then we realized that we had to move very very fast so we did move very fast and uh, uh, the previous rules had some 25 odd forms we removed 20 out of 25 forms there were 11 types of licenses authorizations approvals you needed to have an operator's permit just like a like a lufthansa or a, or a united airlines you you needed to have an operator's permit we removed the permit similarly several other licenses again i'll fast forward uh, 20 out of 25 forms gone there were 72 types of fees because if there are 25 forms naturally the each form would have different uh, menu card like uh, like starters or main course or something so there would be a menu card and 72 fee items uh, from small amounts to large amounts we brought it down to just four and all of that was just about 1.2 dollars just about 100 rupees uh, and they were valid for 10 years. The costliest was 1,000 rupees, which was valid again for 10 years. So effectively, per annum was only 10, 100 rupees. This is if, if you want to start a drone school. And we moved as a policy from uh, Aircraft Act, which is our uh, the act which controls uh, all the, the planes that you see flying in, in India, to s something which is called a Motor Vehicles Act. That was the philosophy. So it, it comes down to just registration of the drone, quality check on the drone, registration of drones, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then a, a drone school uh, authorization, and then uh, a drone pilot certificate. And then we very within 30 days we also release the airspace map because I mean if you fly in a green zone, where exactly is the green zone? So we worked with uh, some 36 uh, state police and uh, uh, their police authorities and some uh, three armed forces. Then eight or nine uh, central agencies, those two-letter, three-letter agencies we can't talk about. So almost 50-plus agencies. And in 30 days, we tried and created that airspace map, which now is available on Google. There was also questions raised as to how can you just allow free access. But that was also resolved. And now you have free access. Just do a Google. You don't need any one-time password or any uh, password. And you can see where you're sitting. Is that a green zone or red zone? Happy to share that now India's 90%, which is unprecedented in the world, 90% of India is now green. And in that green also, now you don't need to take any police permission because even in green, you have to inform the local police stations. You don't need to do that. 90% is now green. Please go and fly up to 400 feet. Beyond that is helicopters and uh, fighter jets and all that. So then you have to take ATC permission. But otherwise, that's fine. And then uh, we released the UTM, the unmanned traffic management. Uh, that was in October. And then January, we put all the forms online. January, we also released the certification scheme. In the certification scheme also used to be done by, uh, I'm moving very, very fast, so please just stop me or maybe ask me later if I'm moving too fast and if you're missing important details. Uh, and in January, we had the certification scheme because, um, and there too, because of some of the feedback that we received that earlier it was done by our regulators, we completely privatized it. We said, you're private, now go to private. So there are three uh, world famous labs, uh, uh, three certification agencies, which I'm paneled by the government. You can go to any of those any of those three and get your drone tested and they also the prime minister's office asked for time limits so within two months they have to give their yes or a no along with reason as per that manual as to which clause of the manual do you does your drone violate if it doesn't you get a okay and uh, after that it comes to a regulator dgc and dgc has two weeks to uh, give, give you a type certificate once you get a type certificate you can manufacture as many drones as you want and each drone will have a registration number which again you will generate through our digital sky platform which is an online platform no more coming to the ministry or the uh, or the government so this happened in uh, jan and then in february we had the import uh, ban because we saw that almost 98 percent of drones were coming from our friendly neighbor up north and there were some other uh, issues which were raised by security agencies so we banned all imports. At the same time, we also removed the FDI limits. So earlier it was uh, your company had to be 51% majority Indian owned. Now it's 100% foreign owned. You can set up a 100% foreign owned drone company in India, but you have to set it up in India. At the same time, components are free. Uh, you can always bring in any number of components and assemble it here and uh, uh, sell it. And uh, February, we also had the drone pilot license. We removed that. And then we also, in September last year, we came up with the, and I'll stop after this, uh, is the production linked incentive scheme. Because First, we want to do the policy uh, reforms and then uh, uh, create demand. So we have some 14 ministries with which uh, with whom we worked to try and create generate uh, generate demand from the highways, railways, defense, home, etc., agriculture, uh, chemical and fertilizers, mining uh, industry, mining uh, ministry. So there were some 14 ministries with whom we were coordinating and creating demand by giving out work orders and RFPs because the private sector always takes some time to come back. Uh, the other leg was, so one was this demand creation, the other was incentives through which we, we had this ELI scheme, the production linked incentive scheme for three years. Whatever you make, we'll give you 20% of the value addition as a cashback uh, to you. 
and uh, uh, also mentioned about the supply side, uh, which is the import ban and uh, lots of other uh, simple simplification steps done so that the component industry also comes up in India. So I'll, I'll just stop here and maybe we can take more questions later. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, that really was a very brief but crisp summary of uh, all that happened, action-packed last uh, 24 months uh, within India. Uh, Kim, if I can come to you, maybe. Uh, you have uh, implemented as Zipline uh, projects all over the world, which have created huge societal value uh, in Africa and other parts of the world. Uh, how do you think uh, were some of the challenges that you faced while rolling out your systems as uh, complete end-to-end -end solutions? And what do you, do you think went right or what were the key learnings from those experiences, if you could maybe share about two, three of them, uh, which could help uh, us to understand how to scale up the adoption. Perfect. Um, lovely to be here. Thanks, Rajan. So for those of you who don't know, Zipline is an American company that runs drone logistics. Uh, and it is the most prolific and successful drone company in delivery space for commercial healthcare in the world right now. We're currently at around 430,000 commercial deliveries, which increases by 1,000 plus deliveries a day. And we have presence at national scale in Rwanda and Ghana, expanding to national scale in Cote d'Ivoire, opening up in Kenya and Nigeria this year, present in three to four US states, and we've launched in Japan as of three months ago. Um, this is a company that is a decade old though. And so what you hear a lot about Zipline is really the success of the last year or two. But something that is really uh, evident is how long it took to get to this stage of success. And so I think one of the initial challenges that comes up when you think about drone delivery and healthcare is this immediate instinct to think about it as an emergency use case. And that the, the most prolific use case for healthcare can be how do you supply something for someone in need? When Zipline engineers early on started looking at healthcare as a use case, they stepped back and looked at it as a system problem. And they asked the question, well, why are these emergencies coming up? And these emergencies were coming out because there were problems around expired goods. There were problems around stockouts in a number of facilities. And so what they saw was that this was actually an inventory management and a supply chain challenge. And so what the biggest solution could be is how do you then centralize inventory and supply chain? And how do you provide a service that is so reliable that any doctor or clinic or, or um, facility within a 250 kilometer range, they know that they can rely on a service and call up and say, we need bloods, we need medicines, we need antibiotics, and we need them within five to 30 minutes. We're on an operating table and we're running out of stock, or we know that we're gonna have a school full of kids tomorrow come in for vaccines and we need a resupply. So you're looking at a system problem and you're looking at a high re reliability challenge because once you start replacing a medical service, you can't say, okay, we can only fly in certain, in certain temperatures. You can't say we can only fly in daylight. You have to build out a system that is highly reliable. And so I'd say the, probably the two biggest learnings we had early on was how do you persuade people that this is actually a systems problem, an inventory problem, a supply chain problem? And then how do you persuade them to, to have the patience and to build from a very small starting set? So when we started in Rwanda, we started delivering only to a couple of clinics and now we deliver to the whole country. And so I would say that's the third lesson we learned is how do you find the visionaries, the people who understand that while you're solving a systems problem, you need to start with one step and you need to build the confidence of not just the community, but the regulators, the technicians to say, this is a service that will be ultimately so reliable that you can have people going in on an operating table and know that whether they have the goods or not, they can be provided. So I think the, the main sort of lessons we learned over time were always step back and look at what is the actual systems problem behind it? What is the business case that makes this incredibly compelling? Which then ultimately leads to the holy grail of drone delivery, which is the unit economics. Because as soon as you find the business case that is compelling, over time you learn the lessons that make the unit economics viable. And then the second is how do you build a reliable system that you can fly in? We operate in the Eastern Ghana desert region where you're operating in temperatures up to 40 to 43 degrees in the heat of summer. Uh, we operate in Rwanda, which has a, a bizarrely high amount of lightning in the world given its place in, in the tropical line. So how do you operate in, in monsoon weather and desert weather in the night, in the day? And then the third one is how do you find those visionaries, those advocates who understand that you need to take a little bit of a risk. 
you have to upfront the cost is going to be higher to justify the unit economics in year two, year three, year four. And you have to build the confidence and the community engagement and the regulatory engagement. Um, I think I was also as brief as I could be considering there's 10 to 12 learnings in there, but I would say business case, systems learning, visionaries, and how do you build a reliable system? Thank you. Uh, that really was insightful. Uh, and I think uh, that maybe give, brings me an opportunity, Sedan, to talk to you about uh, uh, when drones fly and they capture all this aerial imagery, uh, there's a huge amount of data that get, gets collected. And I think whether it's the video imagery or it's all the other data that gets gathered, uh, ultimately it's not just the providing the view or providing the delivery. Ultimately, there's a lot of uh, opportunity to leverage that data for solving impactful problems. Uh, can you, based on uh, global experience, uh, cite a few examples uh, that you would like to share uh, with the audience as to which are those uh, problems that have been solved using the intelligence or all the analytics that can be done on the drone-based imagery and data? And number two, if you could maybe supplement that with uh, what do you think you know and understand the Indian market? Uh, what do you think needs to be done in the Indian context to make the same, uh, let's say, problem solving happen? Thanks, Rajan. Um, it's a very easy question. Um, it's interesting because for us at Balance Air, we pride ourselves on fixing the world's hardest problems. I mean, that's why we attract the best talent in the world. Well, not me particularly, but lots of other people, including Kim, who used to be with me till, till she decided to go uh, fix uh, the problems that Zipline's trying to fix. But a lot of the work that we do is usually in denied spaces or in areas and geographies and topologies that are not conducive to laying out technology per se or not conducive by itself to be uh, deploying products um, in, in a commercial sense. But having said that um, and knowing the fact that most of our successes are the silent successes, the ones we don't talk about in public, um, one of the things that we've been very, very pleasantly surprised to see in the drone space has been the commodification or, and proliferation of sensor sets. So video uh, on drones, a few years ago, for those of you who remember, the average payload size of a video sensor that needed to be deployed in a commercially available COTS solution drone was incredibly high. So someone wanted to deploy in a uh, mining sector to be able to do a assessment of a large pile of, of mined material, or someone wanted to use it for search and rescue, uh, would not be able to actually have the loiter time for, for a drone to actually go there, look for survivors, and come back. Some of the work we did with um, Project Rubicon in the US, which is very, very well known in terms of the work we've done for search and rescue, um, putting all the different first responders on the same platform is fundamentally the same problem we see across the world. We came out of one of the world's largest uh, tragedies, which is 9-11. We were founded on the belief in the principle that data has to be shared, data is not something that is going to be kept in silos, and that digital transformation is not a product as much a mindset. Um, and we've realized over the years that our work in national security and our work in, in the government is the same as the work in, in commercial spaces or in civilian spaces. So, for example, in California, we help monitor wildfires uh, just using commercial available off-the-shelf technology, looking at imagery, applying models at the edge, uh, being able to update those micro models on the fly, and then provide that to the teams that are monitoring wildfires in a single platform that can be pushed out to folks on the ground and tell them, okay, we are seeing this trend in the wind, we are seeing this trend in the weather, we are seeing the fire is spreading in this particular direction, we already have publicly available information about census data, who lives where and what demographic lives there. How can we manage to be able to make sure that people are safe on the fly live in situations like this? Now, as, as Kim said, not everything is an emergency. In areas like um, the World Food Program, Everything we do in every area that we do it in is an emergency. We are, we are constantly running out against time and logistic support and denied territory to be able to provide people with what they need most, food. And the fundamental issue always comes back to the building block of all technology, which is data. Data is flowing through your smartphone, it's flowing through those drones and all the sensors you've deployed on it. 
It's flowing through the computerized systems at the back end that are analyzing all the information. It's, and it's also with the first responders on the ground who are trying to make sense of what's going on. And how do you have one collective fabric where all of that is available in the right model in the right way? I think that is fundamentally where we have seen the most amount of um, difference being made. Uh, to your second question, Rajan, um, I think in India it's been very interesting for us as a business. We've, uh, we've noticed a lot of visionaries uh, come and we've noticed a lot of changes happening in a very positive and in a very, uh, uh, I must say, with great speed. Um, till recently, there was no open government data, and now in the last 10 years, as Antra has written in one of her excellent papers that I would also like to plug along with the UAV paper, we've got a complete open government data community where you've got uh, ministries publishing data, uh, which, uh, I mean, Mr. Dubey here has, has, has spent uh, uh, a couple of years in bureaucracy. He understands exactly how that would have felt to a bureaucrat 10 years ago to be able to publicly share the data for their ministry and actually have it publicly audited and available to average citizens, if not just their, their, their superiors. It's, it's unthinkable. And now that data is available publicly for you to use and make sense of. You have communities building on top of that data. And now you have uh, you know, people like Rohan here and people like um, Antara who are analyzing the policy around it, building products on top of that data, and are able to then service the market based on the needs they see. And I think that in itself is the ecosystem that is, I mean, I'm going to leave legislation to, to you know, better and brighter minds like Rajan and, and Mr. Dubey here, who have been visionaries on this. But on, on, on an ecosystem perspective, the average citizen can access the data. They can ask their lawmakers questions based on that data. And then they can commodify that data based on the use cases that the community needs. I think that in itself is, is phenomenal. And that is the great leveling force in India that we are seeing. Thanks. Uh, I think so. We've heard uh, a couple of international players talk about some of their learnings and sharing some of the best practices. Uh, Rohan, let me come to you. Uh, at 19 years, you started a drone startup, right? And at 29, uh, you're already shifted from a drone startup to a space uh, company. And uh, one of the things uh, which uh, we believe, uh, and this is a problem that many companies, including the larger and the smaller ones, are facing, is that uh, for drone uh, industry to become a $500 billion global industry in the next, let's say, eight to 10 years, uh, there is a need for a huge amount of talent to get attracted, right? Top talent. Uh, it's exciting for people to do projects, but to attract talent at the absolute top levels, you need uh, to really get the cream of that into the sector. Can you share some of the aspects from your perspective, what can be done to attract talent to this industry? Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Rajan. Uh, uh, pleasure to be part of the panel. <coughs> uh, I mean, uh, what I would like to say is, uh, when we started building a drone was uh, a lot of engineering which goes into it. Today, it's just a hobby. A school kid is able to do a drone. And uh, what needs to be done or uh, where uh, you can retain a talent is what applications can you build once you have a platform. So um, uh, that's the problem statement which uh, currently India has to solve. Um, uh, for example, uh, what we do, uh, we needed, a, for example, a person to design a control algorithm, but there's no curriculum available in our country. So we sponsored his education to one of uh, the good universities in the US. Uh, who can work under the professor best known for this and uh, on the understanding that he comes back and uh, helps set up this uh, for, uh, for our company, Bellatrix, for example. So, uh, and what we see when we hire people, or uh, youngsters especially, is they want to do, uh, or they want to take up very interesting problems. So they don't want to do, I don't, um, I mean, say for example, something like a hobby. Okay, uh, drone, after a month they're bored about it. So what can they do more? This is what we see. And this has been a challenge for us to retain. For example, if a project is being delayed, for example, and uh, uh, they just leave, right? And, uh, uh, and we are finding it difficult to give uh, problem statements to them so that uh, uh, the talent pool can be retained. So uh, what we end up doing is, uh, we, of course, we speak to the government, of course, at the policy level, the national education policy. Uh, um, as Mr. Dubey was also telling, uh, there's uh, Atal Tinkering Labs, uh, which ties up with school in India. 
um, but at present they're only teaching kids how to fly but um, not how to design and in the engineering curriculum there's no uh, course on drones especially okay you just study so uh, not just how to build it but what are the applications both at the policy level and I was the last student in my batch which read about civil airworthiness requirements. After that, the engineer, uh, engineers found it boring, so that subject was also scrapped. So now, uh, uh, that's actually a very important subject to have. So we need to relook at the curriculum at the engineering level so that when p students come out, uh, they know what uh, they want to do so that it's easier for companies like us to uh, hire skilled talents. And um, uh, of course, uh, you have to create interest, and um, I feel it should not be uh, just uh, you know uh, retained as a hobby. Um, there's a lot of application, and uh, you can't even think of. For example, can you imagine a new color? No, right? So you, uh, it's all a uh, mix of red, blue, and green. Similarly, the applications of drone, uh, uh, what in a country, diverse country like India, is plenty, and uh, we have only captured around five to ten percent of. We are not even clear where what uh, miracles it can do. Uh, for example, organ transplant, we need um, beyond visual line of sight drones. So there are a lot of applications like that. And um, yeah, I think uh, this is the starting point. Let's see where India goes in 2030. Thank you. Thank you. And I think just to quickly update uh, everyone, uh, the Ministry of Electronics and IT is actually building a new curriculum in India. Uh, which is a task force that Mr. Dubey and I are both uh, part of in terms of driving uh, what should be done to build capacity at scale, right, over the next uh, few years, number one. Number two, even on the use cases and problem statements, right, uh, we, uh, as part of that uh, standards body, are also looking at listing out more than 100 or close to 100 use cases and then mapping that to the kind of curriculum that's needed for the drone pilots, for example. Very well said, uh, really. Coming, uh, last but not the least, Antara, to you. Uh, you've written a wonderful paper that I've already mentioned. Everyone should read about drones. Uh, captures in a very crisp manner what has happened. Uh, for scaling up the adoption, now that the policy, as you call the drones 3.0 policy, is taken care of, what are your perspectives, again, from a customer perspective, that you think can be done for adopting drones at scale? Um, thank you so much for uh, asking that question, Rajan, and thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful panel. Uh, I think when we're talking about scaling up adoption, there are three actors that are going to be uh, playing a very important part. One would be government, since they are the largest procurers of drones. Uh, when it comes to possibly the medicine in the sky project th that has uh, gained an enormous support from the media, it has gained enormous uh, acceptance from the people. And then we are also talking about the Samitva scheme, which you have very uh, rightly mentioned in the description of the panel as well, that is required for information gathering. Then there is payload deliveries. Then there is geospatial mapping. There is aerial surveillance. The government is using the drones in a number of sectors for a number of use cases. The other uh, uh, part of the actor, the other actor that could be playing an important role could be the consumers, the end consumers. And for that to happen, it would be very important for such use cases that the government is working on and the ones that are still like uh, the Telangana Harabra pro uh, project where they are focusing on afforestation of the, uh, uh, of the forests, it would be very interesting if these are some of the use cases that are also highlighted so that the, gov uh, the so that the end consumers are also aware of what all the government is working on. And one thing that could be done is a compendium can be released by MOCA for making sure that people are aware of all the use cases in a publicly accessible manner so that uh, what Zipline is doing with the government or what Palantir is doing with the government is also publicly accessible to common people. And the third could be increasing manufacturing as well. And for that, uh, collaboration is going to play a key role. And for that to happen, it is not just the end users that are going to be playing an important role, but also 
uh, for example, an enterprise has figured out one part of the solution where what needs to be done in terms of grocery delivery and the other part of uh, the, uh, the other enterprise that collaborates with the uh, enterprise that has figured out the first solution can help with the technical aspect of the story where they are providing drones, they are making sure that the maintenance is happening, they are making sure that the data collected is also leveraged for other use cases as well, which supports collaboration and possibly government can also, like when we are incentivizing uh, drone startups through public uh, production linked incentives as uh, uh, Amr mentioned, we could also use that as an opportunity to perhaps incentivize collaboration between enterprises as well. Wonderful. In fact, uh, I think uh, that kind of, uh, and we will maybe offline talk about some of those aspects because I believe a lot already is happening in some of these areas, but I think also kind of brings me to the next point, uh, Amber, for you. Uh, we talked about international collaboration. We recently, uh, I think you and I are aware, had initiated a collaboration between India and Israel uh, with the World Economic Forum uh, taking up kind of center stage in organizing that kind of uh, collaboration platform. And I think uh, whether it's government to government collaboration or business to business collaboration, especially when it comes to components, you mentioned about import of components is free. So on one side, while let's say there may be a perception about customers or professionals being denied the use of drones like it's available in other countries, but how do you see some of those international collaborations coming up, especially <coughs> for components and uh, especially with the ban of uh, completed drones? No, we've seen a lot of interest in, uh, even in, uh, and, and it's not just the normal drones which uh, spray chemicals or uh, do surveillance and surveys. Uh, videography, etc. Even in urban air mobility, drone taxis, I mean, we don't want you to, maybe 10 years down the line from the airport, you'll come straight to ITC Moria sitting in a drone taxi right outside the airport. So, uh, they're also Japanese, Americans, French, I mean, we've had multiple delegations, our own honorable minister has been to IKO in Canada, US, and he's met a whole plethora of uh, investors who are looking at this giant market, I mean, other than uh, Beyond China, this is the largest market. Where will you find 1.3 uh, people who are ready to uh, sign the check for you? So whether uh, it's for the poor people, it's the government which steps in, and uh, individual corporates, uh, they also use a whole variety of drones for various uses. So this, this is the biggest market. And uh, we've taken a conscious call not to uh, allow import of uh, completely built drones or CKD or SKD. It's almost the same trajectory we did in electronics or even in automotive. And uh, there also we face the same existential question, chicken and egg. Uh, if, if there is no Indian solution available, how can we ban foreign products? But we just, uh, we, we did it. And uh, now uh, after a passage of time, we are seeing all the biggest brands all have their factories here. And we are very liberal. We, uh, on the FDI front, uh, uh, there is a lot of IP protection contrary to what you hear in uh, some of the biased media. But otherwise, uh, why would a Mercedes or a BMW or some of the top brands come and operate here? They're manufacturing here. Now, iPhone is iPhone 14 is made out of India. So I think the, uh, we can go on and on. But uh, uh, there are lots of evidence which says that this is a great place to do business in. There's also that China plus one uh, thing. How much uh, can you pack in that one basket uh, up north? Uh, so come to India is a great place to do business in. Uh, FDI limits are removed under the new rules. Earlier it, uh, it had to be an Indian uh, majority. Now you can have a 100% US, 100% German, 100% French, or 100% Israeli company operating out of India. Or you could do a joint venture if you find a good partner. Again, we are not going to tell you who to date or to marry, but uh, it's your choice. So I think uh, it's, it's a good time to be in India. Thank you. Thanks, and I think uh, that sets uh, me up for uh, Kim. Uh, so as uh, a global player uh, looking at an India opportunity, how do you see your international collaborations, and especially maybe from an India perspective, how do you see uh, some of those international collaborations play out? Uh, obviously, India is a huge market in terms of what zipline the impact that this technology could have. When you think about even something like the northeastern regions and setting up a drone that could deliver medical packages to any medical facility within 250 kilometres range any time they need, that could have huge impact. However, there is a reality that as a startup, in terms of having a lot of constraints around supply chain in, in an optimistic time, let alone in the times we are now, it's incredibly hard for a growing company to move a lot of their supply chain and manufacturing early on to another country. So I think when we look at India, we see a huge impact and huge business case. 
But we do see that the constraints mean we will be operating or working with an Indian partner and trying to figure out what does that look like in terms of the reality is it may be a couple of years or more before Zipline is at the stage where it can start looking at the scale. So I think on one hand, I completely understand from a, a country's point of view and building your own economy and, and having been, being Australian and operating from an island and looking at how important it is to build your own indus industry, we really understand that. But I think at the same time, coming from the point of view as a growing company where we're still trying to establish ourselves, it's a, it's a very big ask of, of emerging technologies in terms of that. So I think comparing an emerging technology with where your Boeings and your BMWs are is, is a huge ask to make. And so I'd say to India, that's probably the, the challenge that's before you. And um, we look forward to collaborating, but it's a challenge. Yeah, and I think it's an opportunity as well. Uh, please. Three, three seconds, the two last names that it took, uh, the big giants of aerospace, the big two, even they are not in India <laughs> in a big way. <laughs> Everybody takes time. They've been around for 70 years. So uh, I think uh, while Zipline can still claim they are still a startup, but I don't think uh, Palantir can claim that, uh, right, Siddhant? So as, as a startup that has scaled uh, to a large company and has done a successful IPO, what are your learnings for, let's say, the drone startups of the world, right? Uh, especially not just in India, but globally. How should they really look at their scale up uh, uh, while the customer adoption is something we spoke about? But from a perspective of a drone startup, where do you think uh, they have opportunities to succeed? That's, that's a great question. I'm not sure I'll be able to do justice to it, but. Um, Yes, we are no longer, I mean, we still operate as a startup, but we are obviously now 3,000 plus um, people across the world. Um, you know, the two things that, that are the building blocks of who we are as a company are, uh, or as Sham, our CEO, or Dr. Kapa, our CEO, say, culture eats strategy for breakfast um, and build it and they will come. And as cliched as that sounds, that's incredibly true. Uh, we built it, and everyone came. And um, the culture that we built it around, where everyone's incredibly empowered to do what they want, decision-making lies at the edges of the organization. There is no centralized model of what we do and how we do it, as long as we're doing it aligned around the principles and beliefs that, that make us who we are. Uh, we are. We are all solving the world's hardest problems wherever we find them. And if we don't find them, we go looking for them. Um, I think for India, one of the things that I feel personally very proud of is, is the dynamism we see in the community. Government is doing everything it can to unlock that potential, but on the private sector side, on, on, on the civilian side of, of the ecosystem, the market is, is booming. Connectivity has gone through the roof in the last couple of years, as, as my colleague from Meta was saying earlier today, that they have more users here now than, than they have anywhere else, uh, by the sounds of it. Um, we have conversations like this to understand regulation and policy uh, in an open setting. Um, and we're able to have startup founders build and scale up their businesses in India. India is all about scale. If you build it and scale it in India, you can succeed anywhere. Uh, the flip side of that is, as our dear friend from the UAE, Minister Olama, was saying yesterday to Samir, is that sometimes that scale can be daunting. Sometimes that scale is incredibly fragmented um, and hyper-localized for you to be successful. So my only bit of advice would be that we need a three-tiered system that I think is being built out. It's very evident it's being built out, whether it's happening organically or by human construct remains to be seen. Um, the first is you've got to be able to share data with each other, and you've got to do it in a privacy-compliant way. Um, uh, you've got to be able to do it with the safeguards that that data requires, because data is now the new gold. Um, or the new snake oil, depending on who you talk to. Um, and you should be able to share that data in, in the ways it's supposed to be used without being able to expose people's information or let it get um, commodified or misused and misutilized. And, and we are big believers in, in building and baking privacy and civil liberties into our products for that reason. The second is once you've built the ecosystem for the data to be shared, you need people to be able to interact with that uh, data. Um, all these sensors from drones to um, 
every little bit of technology that is being deployed here commercially needs to be able to be able to put together to make sense of it. What does this mean for us? How is this going to help me? One of the examples that I was thinking of while we were just talking about wildfire protection, we've got uh, the winter season coming. You've got uh, crop burning going to be happening in the north of Delhi. Happens year after year. Um, and it's no fault of the farmers, but that's the way it's happened. And the pollution and the health hazards and risks that come with it. I mean, if there was a, and I, I noticed the other day that uh, the Ministry of Rural Development has open sourced their entire data asset uh, as part of the PM's Gram Sadak Yojana, where now I have, I believe, almost a million, if not a million more, rural um, uh, hotspots in the country where I can actually accurately map out where the bus station is, where the crops are, where uh, schools are, where hospitals are. I mean, if there's an entrepreneur out there, I'm pretty sure this is India. There's dynamism, there's idealism, there's principles. I think people are going to put together a business model on top of that and say, maybe I don't want to be a farmer. I want to help my father and my grandfather be able to predict when they start burning these crops, which direction the smoke is going to go in, what the wind patterns look like, and what crops are succeeding and failing, and what does you know, irrigation look like. And how does that happen? You collect the data, you put it in a privacy compliant way and let people interact with it, and then they can build on top of it uh, locally. And last one, as, as Rajan and uh, Mr. Dube were talking about manufacturing and make in India, I mean, you can go downstream from, from the market and actually start looking at manufacturing and say, okay, where did this component come from? Can I source it all the way down? I mean, we do this with Airbus uh, time and time again. We do it for every single Airbus aircraft that, that operates in the world. We can trace down to a component level where that came from. It's not that we, we uh, invented that. It's just that we were able to put it together and say, okay, we should be able to share all this data between airline manufacturers and be able to make sense of it. So I think it's, it's basically going to boil down to be able to put the data together and, and commodify it. Thanks. Uh, uh, Rohan, uh, I think let me pose a, maybe a question to you talking about uh, one of the things that uh, anybody needs, and I think we heard it during the lunch session as well, is about access to capital. Uh, you already successfully raised some funding as well. and. Uh, what are your thoughts about the challenges and uh, access to funding? Is there anything that the industry body or a think tank can do to help support some of those activities? Um, yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, so we call ourselves the OG group. So we had to face all the difficulties when uh, uh, we, I mean, we went for fundraise. Uh, but now the competition is so huge. That as you're aware, there are more than 250 companies. Uh, the question comes to differentiation and origi original idea. So how does the business scale? So that's where I think think tanks and companies can come together to help identify if that's an original idea or if there's a differentiation at all. And then we, what we need, especially for the uh, drone ecosystem in India, is dedicated accelerators, um, uh, uh, which currently uh, we do not have. Um, uh, that will be o o one of the major achievements if you're able to set that up at key locations across the country. And uh, increasing funding by the government at college level, if you have a project, uh, uh, I don't think that uh, works because uh, that's a s little bit a slow process. Rather, what we can do is government has identified the problem statement. And that's where I feel bigger companies can um, help set up incubators in good colleges which offer uh, these courses. And these incubators can fund the original idea, and uh, the companies can come and evaluate if this works or not. Uh, but uh, being in this competitive um, stream today, uh, we need to see how we can differentiate so that uh, the amount of time which, uh, say, a bigger corporate or government spends with a smaller company actually reaps 10x benefits. So I'll end with that. And of course, the most important point is, uh, at the project level, uh, they should know about international partnerships and how they can redefine. You need not reinvent the wheel. So what the mistake we did doing is we sort of reinvented the wheel. So uh, that's something which uh, today, uh, with opening up of uh, this particular domain, we should look at international partnerships. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Antara, once again, uh, you have the last word uh, before we open up for questions. Uh, what do you think... Uh, really is needed to be done anything which we missed out right from a government perspective from an industry perspective or even from a customer perspective what else do you think have we not covered here from a not just an adoption but maybe de-risking the scale-up journey so uh, 
one thing that drone regulation 3.0 as i mentioned in my paper have done is they have provided a stable policy ecosystem and if we were to scale up our adoption it is very important for consumers as well the end end consumers being drone pilots here to know how much time is it going to take for them to apply for the drone pilot license how uh, how do they go about applying it and that is where the digital sky platform and it's as updated as it can be which has uploaded uh, they have uploaded all the documents that are required <coughs> to facilitate the process comes into play the other thing is cost so we have banned imports of drones but these drones are also cheap on the cheaper side of things so if our made in india technology we have to foster that we have to also make sure that it comes within the budget of the end consumer and that is where most of the startups as i am aware are also working on reducing the costs of sourcing these uh, these products required for manufacturing drones also producing these uh, drones and uh, one thing that i was speaking to rohan about uh, prior to this was also that uh, the scale is required uh, if they are able to manufacture it that's good but for them to be able to manufacture it at a level where they they meet consumers needs consumer also have to be aware of all the use cases and that is where the first point that i had raised about making consumers aware of what are the different use cases uh, the one more thing that drones as a a uh, technology has done for india is that it has created enormous job opportunities and that is where assemblers come in manufacturers come in developers come in and that is where your uh, mighty standard setting body which is working on the curriculum also plays a very important role and something that i have mentioned in my paper as well is that it is not just about training people for becoming drone pilots of the future but also become becoming more aware of what are the processes required to develop it so they are also not just manufacturing drones assembling drones developing drones they are also pilots they are also using it not just for photography they are assisting the government with the pil uh, the serving purposes as well and uh, government has also done a brilliant job at incentivizing the uptake of drones in the agricultural sector especially by incentivizing end consumers which are the farmers by making sure that they're monetarily in incentivized to buy drones utilize their uh, power the other thing that i think would be my expectation as a end consumer would be to have drone taxi so that i don't have to worry about the traffic anymore coming from the airport <laughs> <laughs> yeah on that note i think that's something all of us are expecting uh, yeah, in the near future Uh, we have time for maybe one or two quick question quick questions uh, anybody uh, wanting to ask a specific question please uh, raise your hands otherwise we could collaborate over dinner and answer the rest of them please uh, if you could quickly identify yourself and ask your question so uh, my myself would serve mithal and uh, you will see me tomorrow on metaverse so i am one of the cyber security you know influencers in india so uh, as you know the sci-fi is all about security i think we are missing about the safety and security protocols and nobody mentioned that so i thought of bring it up no just to clarify right up front uh, i think you <laughs> came in a little late we mentioned that today we will talk about the promise and not the perils the perils uh, will take us into a different discussion altogether so maybe we can discuss the perils all in right, smaller right. groups but do we have a standard in place yeah so i think uh, the quality council of india has a standard which gives you a type certificate as mr dubey was mentioning that's a very rigorous uh, process and once you get that type certificate only then you can fly a drone so that has already been put into place the bureau of indian standard also is doing some work on that and i think now the next stage is actually how do we get down to the next level of component level uh, details but it's uh, definitely work in progress uh, any other yeah Hi, uh, <clears throat> my name is Ankan Dey. I'm with I work with Niti Aayog, and I uh, wanted to address Rohan that point you raised about the utter tinkering labs. So I think the the problem is that when you when you have a labs at that scale, you have to depend on development kits which are available. So it'll be very interesting for the drone and uh, the startup or someone to come up with a kit which kids can play around with and build stuff on. 
So uh, if that is something that you can work on, I think that'll be a, like you have a whole ecosystem of young people who can probably benefit from that. So uh, here's the problem I see. So uh, this has not been um, heard by a lot of uh, these kit makers. So uh, there are a lot of uh, people um, uh, in India who uh, make and sell these drone kits, but they're not aware of the opportunity which... So uh, maybe this is something said. where you can... Now maybe that's something which you should make public. Uh, uh, well, in fact, so I think it's an interesting point. There's a Bombay-based startup which is already supplying educational drone kits to global markets and awareness is not, I think it's more of an awareness issue and maybe more of those could come up. Good point. Uh, any others? Uh, please. Uh, just a couple of points, actually. One is uh, when I heard about the agriculture application, in fact, uh, I am a user of it, not me direct. I, run, I am CEO of Reliance Foundation, and uh, many of the farmers we work with, uh, they use drones. But the real challenge is still the affordability. So the question to the panel is, uh, when is it that uh, we make them really affordable for the farmers who otherwise struggle for their two meals and make it uh, really impactful for the nation? One point. Second, to Rohan's uh, thing about uh, the talent. I think one of the important things, my observation again, being part of the foundation and generally following the education space too, uh, is that uh, we are having uh, unidimensional education, by and large. Uh, that's the root cause of many of the problems we have in our education system. I'm not trying to be critical about the overall education system. Of course, NEP is trying to address partly. It will take its time, 10, 15, 20 years. But in the short term to medium term, how are we going to address this is for the policy makers and others, other people who are part of think tanks to think about as to how would we address this. I think that will solve your problem on talent part of it. Thank you, uh, Amr. Uh, I have some point of view you would like to share. Uh, your thoughts? So I'll keep it very brief because this is an interesting subject. We can go on for the next 30 minutes. But uh, on the affordability front, as I mentioned about the PLI scheme, so 20% of it's one of the very lucrative schemes. No other sector gives 20% of value addition. Uh, so that is on the manufacturing side. Plus, we put money in the hands of the buyer also. So this is a very unique uh, situation where the manufacturer and the buyer both get money from two different ministries. Uh, it's all coming from the taxpayers sitting here. But uh, uh, on uh, on the agriculture side, uh, the institutes, all the univer agriculture universities, PUSA, IRI, etc., get 100%. Then there's 70, this whole menu card, KVKs, Kishan, Krishi, Vika, Vikas, Kendras get whatever, 75%, custom hiring centers, 50%, et cetera, et cetera. All farmers, all women farmers and SCST farmers get 50% off. So there is that menu card. In fact, uh, pretty much it opens up to all farmers because if I'm a farmer and I'm not SCST, I can always get in the name of my wife. So pretty much everybody is covered, all farmers, 50% off. Where in the world do you get drones at 50% off? So I think we, from both sides, we're trying to make it simpler. And plus, it's going to be just like the mobile phone. These are very costly 20 years back. Uh, it's a demand and supply thing as it uh, proliferates and people see the benefits uh, uh, because I'm told uh, the urea consumption comes down by 30%, Product yield goes up by 15 to 20%, and water consumption, many of our areas are actually water scars. 80 to 90% water reduction because in an acre, you just need the 10 liter tank, which can, is good enough for an for acre, which otherwise takes 150 to 200 liters of, of that where you throw by hand and then put water and hope that uh, that urea gets dissolved and goes into the roots and the stem to the leaf. Here we put it directly on the leaf. So, I mean, I don't want to go on and on, but on the affordability front, once the farmers, and farmers are very sharp, they may not be as uh, educated or maybe with all the fancy degrees or colleges, but uh, very, very sharp. Once they see things, they get to know. And then let's add to that the, the medical cost, which we don't add on a per acre basis. When they do this this knapsack uh, kind of spray, it's pretty much the mist is right in front of them. They cover their eyes or whatever. But they have skin problem, eye problem, lung problem. And they all add to our medical costs. And that also uh, hurts their daily productivity and daily earning. Many of them are daily wage earners who wait for that harvest season or the spray season. So if we add the medical costs and the productivity and the reduction in urea, which is only going to get more and more costly uh, with the oil prices and the uh, dollar rate going up, I think everywhere it makes sense to go to use technology in agriculture. And uh, now with these communities coming up and the, all the benefits that they're getting on the, the from the agriculture ministry, I think it will uh, proliferate and, and the rate will come down, just like mobile phones. Thank Rajan, you. Rajan, I'd like to just quickly add some perspective. I really like Mr. Kumar's first question. Uh, 
you know, I, I think this is goes back to the old analogy of and uh, harping on the same point. It's like crop dusters. Uh, for those of you familiar with crop dusting, is the farmer doesn't need to own the aircraft, right? It, it, the farmer doesn't need to become a pilot to be able to utilize, you know, biochemicals and spray it on his crop. Uh, I think what's going to happen, as as Mr. Dubey and Rajan have been saying, is that the point of that drone is to collect the data. Like it, it's going to tell you something. It, the point of the drone is not to own the airframe. Uh, that's, I mean, unless you're a hobbyist and you want to fly it around or, or you know. Uh, fly it out of green zones, that's up to you. But the fundamental sum and substance of this is that you've got to democratize the data. If the farmer needs that data for their agricultural assessment or for whatever it is uh, that they're using it for, drones should be available as a service. And that service should be uh, regulated in such a way that the data that is captured by the drone operator is then provided to the farmer to then commodify on a national platform like Niti Aayog's uh, national NDAP, I believe. Is that, is that the name? Yeah, NDAP. So NDAP's a great example of that, that you, put, you plug in your data or you have your publicly available data and you can mix and match what you need to come with your use case. And that's, that's where we're going to end up with this. Well, I think just uh, adding uh, to both the points, uh, many companies, including a uh, lot of uh, players, are now starting to deliver it as a service where you don't need to buy the drone. You can either, as a community, buy it or you can just be charged for the service. But I think it's a very interesting point you raised. Just briefly on the second question as well on the curriculum and the education part, I think there is uh, effort happening in creating that specific uh, curriculum. It's in the process. There's a significant grant that's already been approved uh, for uh, a certain set of institutions to be the primary institutions. And then below them, there is a second tier program that's going to run. We can discuss it uh, maybe yeah. overnight. So Rajan, 80 crores, 10 million, uh, million dollars are already allocated for that. Rajan, can I jump in very Please. quickly on the unit economics? And I think Mr. Ambe and Ankara have both uh, spoken about this. We've seen the unit economics make sense at scale. So when you're delivering 300 flights a day, when you're operating multiple centers, you're starting to get into the costs that really make sense both for a government or a consumer side. But the second point that I really like that has been brought up is what are the economics of the value of the cost savings? And so one of the interesting things of having operated for multiple years now, we're seeing studies come out of Zipline's impact where we have a 67% reduction in blood expiry. We have expiry rates in medical centres under 0.2%, which is crazy low. Um, and we have reduced vaccine stock, stock outs by over 40%. And so when you're starting to connect both the, the unit economics at scale, but also what are the preventative cost savings? What is the value of a system? How do you change the narrative from thinking of this as we want to think about the cost of a bike or a motorbike versus a, a drone to what is the cost of changing the system? I think that's when you really start understanding that the unit economics of drones are going to be incredibly impactful. Oh, excellent. And I think uh, since nobody is asked to pack us up, I think let's maybe end it on that uh, last, last question, uh, definitely. Though I know that you don't want to discuss peril, but in the peril only a lot of promise is there. I'm from defense background, as you know, and the law enforcement agencies will be the biggest stakeholders. And a lot of you know, drones will be required by 35 lakh strong LEA of India. Police itself is number 3.5 million in, in our country. Uh, you know, their requirement, their training, uh, and uh, entire ecosystem of uh, drone management. I hope you have kept that in mind. Uh, that is also a promise for you. No, in fact, uh, to be honest, we have done a bottom-up study uh, that was published just a month back where all this demand from the LEAs to the armed forces has been captured. Uh, the demand was about cumulative about $40 billion in the next eight years. And uh, to be honest, that's why some of these things are really now taking shape. But I think just uh, maybe ending up on a, on a global and positive note, I think while the vision has been set by a prime minister to make India the drone manufacturing hub, a lot of opportunities, as we all discussed. I think it's really up to collectively all of us to come together and make that happen. Uh, thank you once again for joining us. It's uh, really been a pleasure. Uh, dinner is now served outside. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Dutra. Please give a round of applause to our panelists and the speakers. Thank you so much.